Welcome to episode number two of uh, my series on uh, defending yourself from the dark arts of stereotype, manipulation, lies, propaganda. Uh, today we're going to be talking about stereotype and archetype and uh, yeah, let's go from there. So generally speaking, what is a stereotype? A stereotype is an, is an overgeneralized belief. It's a, a heuristic. You, you quickly make an assumption about something and you use that. Let me read a definition here. Uh, it's the assumption that all of a thing share the traits share the traits as a small sample of that thing, which is not logically valid. An example would be Loch Ness. So some people say there's a monster in the Loch Ness. Some people say there's a f there's even fish in Loch Ness. All right, which is more likely? Could be you know. So you go and you sample. You take a teaspoon and you sample that lake. Well, your sample size is too small, and uh, and you're not going to see a, a fish or a monster in that teaspoon. So your sample size is too small. So you can't assume that the entire body of water is is represented by your small sample size. That's a stereotype. You know, the whole lake isn't a monolith of what your teaspoon is. And we need to recognize that it's a logical fallacy. We need to know that it is a generalization. It's a heuristic. And we could say, yeah, from our sample size, we don't have any indication of it, but that doesn't mean that there isn't something there. And it's the same thing with, with people. You might have a, I don't want to go into that stuff, but you, you can use stereotype against people and you need to know that not everybody of that sample whatever your random sample happens to be uh, is a monolith of that like all white men aren't all the same as whatever your father was if you have father issues which you happen to see a lot on social media but uh, anyway so there's that our minds use heuristics to uh, and stereotypes to uh, quickly categorize things um to, you know, to see if we need to pay attention to them or not. Um, think about if you're in a waiting room and there's a man, a well-dressed dude on one side and there's somebody who looks like there might be a gang member on the other side. Now, there's only two open chairs, one next to the guy with the suit and one next to the guy who looks like a gang member. Which one do you choose to sit next to? That's your, you're going to be using your stereotype, stereotype thinking here is, uh, you know, which one do you choose? Now, the guy with the... Uh, the, the gang looking member might actually just be a, an honest, hardworking kid who uh, happens to like the fashion or maybe he comes from a rough end of town and he does he dresses like that to sort of protect himself socially. And so people leave him alone. You know, he might be a good guy. And uh, maybe the guy in the suit's a serial killer looking for their next target. So you, you might choose to sit beside the wrong guy. But then again, maybe that, that gang looking member guy is a junkie who's looking to stab you for five bucks. Or maybe the guy in the suit is also a junkie who's willing to stab you for five bucks. We don't know. We don't have enough information. But when you're using your your heuristics of, of in stereotype, that's just what we do. And so we'll, we'll quickly judge somebody. Is this danger? Is this safe? And you'll choose the best path based on your your assumptions and it may not be true and it might be totally wrong but that's sort of how we survive we take the best guess and we need to understand that our guesses aren't fact you know that guy in the suit could be a junkie or a serial killer wanting to kill you or maybe that kid maybe our guesses are right maybe that uh, that gangster is a, a, a kid willing to stab you for five bucks but just know that our stereotypes aren't fact they're just guesses and people use these to association. We'll get into that kind of stuff later on, but to manipulate you. So just be aware that you do use uh, heuristics and, and, and stereotype and they are not infallible. In fact, they are wild guesses, not wild guesses. You're basing it on some sort of models, but still. Okay, this uh, stereotype is closely associated with um, another logical fallacy called the black and white fallacy or the either or fallacy or the false dilemma fallacy where the target is given two could be two different choices to choose from now there could be extreme choices could be black or white or it could be you know just any two choices but the assumption is that there is no third or other options and and you need to be wary of this fallacy because here I'll give you an example. Um, do you want to pay the room, paint the room black or white? Well, you could paint the room gray, one of the millions of shades of gray. Uh, so there's a lot more choices between black and white, or you could also paint it a color, or you could not paint the room, or you could use uh, wallpaper. 
I mean, there's a lot of other options, but the the assumption that the manipulator is trying to give you here is that they're trying to polarize you into thinking that there is only two choices, whatever the two choices are that they give you. Another example would be here's you're either with us or you're against us. Uh, it doesn't give an option for uh, an impartial third party. Other examples are you're either racist or anti-racist or you're fascist or anti-fascist and so on. It polarizes people. And that's the point that oh, I don't know if it's the point I can't give into the motivation of people who are trying to manipulate you because, you know, but it, it's, it has the tendency to polarize people. And this is if you want to polarize people, you will use the stereotype of either or black or white extremes, no gray area when in fact reality is in the gray. Gray. Um, there's so much more. I should, reality also goes to the extremes. There is black, there is white, but there's also a lot more going on in between the two extremes. An archetype, on the other hand, so you have a stereotype, which is uh, it's your final product. You got all this data and you're just trying to sum it down, dumb it down to a level that you can comprehend, that you can use and move on. Where archetype is sort of like the opposite of that. It's your starting point. An archetype is your your definition of something. So it, it's not something that sort of exists. It's just your concept of what that thing is. Say, for example, a chair. You have a concept, an archetype, an archetypical chair in your mind. What is that? Does it have four legs? It has a seat. It has a backrest, right? Is that the definition of a chair? Well, typically, maybe that's a definition, but a, an office chair has five legs, eight legs, wheels on it. Is that a still a chair? Yeah. Is uh, is a lazy boy chair? You know, it's it's a block with no legs and you sit in it. And is that a chair? Yeah. Um, you know, is a rocking chair a chair? It does. It's got it's got two curved sliders or rockers, whatever you call them. You know, that's two. And they're not even flat. They they rock. Is that still a chair? Yeah, probably. Is a uh, is is a tree stump with uh, a backrest? Is that a chair? Well, no, maybe not. I don't know, but where's that definition go? But see, the archetype is the starting point. It's the concept of a chair. It's the it's it's a, a point where you jump from, and your definition of a chair or your archetype will change when you get new data coming in. So if you have a stereotype, it's your you're trying to reduce the data, you're eliminating, you're ignoring all this other data that exists to try to simplify it to the point of it being uh, uh, wrong. And you don't care because you're just trying to use this to get on with whatever you're doing, like a heuristic. You're just, well, what's what, what's what's generally, this is probably the case, so let's go with that. We know it's not true, but it could be this, it may be not, but we're just gonna use this and move on. Whereas an archetype is, we okay, have a concept of something like a tree or a chair, and what is it? So then you'll use that as a, as a point to build from. Let me see if I have a definition here. Uh, an archetype is an original model from which all things of that same kind are based or compared to uh, an archetype is not a logical fallacy, whereas a stereotype is a logical fallacy. There's errors in stereotype, but there's no error in archetype because archetype is your concept. Whatever your it's like a definition. So whatever you define it as, that can't be wrong. That's your definition of something. Now whether that thing exists or not is another story. So different people will have different 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 definitions of think what things are archetypes now that's why we have dictionaries to try to keep everybody on the same page but uh, you know you think of the concept of even a, car, a chair or a car you know some people might look at something and say that's not a chair that's a tree stump with a backrest and other people say well yeah in my mind that's a chair and or you know you think of a car it's another, you know, it's a go-kart. It's got four wheels and a, you steer it and it moves by itself. Is that a car? Well, no, it's not really a car. But then it's a race car, Formula One. It's it's actually has the word car in the name, a race car. But it's got bigger wheels, it's a little bit bigger, and it goes a little faster. Maybe a lot of people might say, yeah, it is a car because it's a race car. But it's just essentially, literally, it's just a bigger go-kart. Some people even call it kart racing because it's just a bigger kart. So why is the Formula One a car and a go-kart not a car? It's just the size, the size of the wheels. What is it? So your definition, it's fuzzy. It's not defined, definite black and white, even though it's a definition. It's it's a gray, it's a, it's a gradient. There's no black and white. Why is my fucking camera flashing now? So 
people have different different definitions of archetypes and uh this this that the fact that there is different definitions or people don't maybe even know exactly what a word means uh manipulators will use that to their advantage and they'll start sliding the definitions of words to mean other things so that that is as a you gotta watch out for that when people start manipulating the definitions of what things are that is a very common tool to come up with new definitions for something and so it's like you need to be you need to have a dictionary with you all the time or just know you know a lot of times you know exactly what the word means and you hear people saying it in a different context and it's a different meaning of that word you're like why are you distorting that word because you're trying to manipulate people to think a different way because words have associations to them like for example conspiracy Ooh, the word conspiracy does it mean something's made up the word conspiracy things do exist there are conspiracies people do get together and plan you know things like in every office in the world people conspire to stop Susie from getting her raise because they want someone else to get the raise or or they don't like Susie you know because she's a bitch and they don't want her to you know maybe be bumped up to manager so they'll conspire to do things behind her back or try to make her look bad or or give subtle drops that you know she's late all the time or she's done this you know these these are conspiracies people getting together to do things that aren't technically legal like i mean how would you prove it but that's just a small scale and you think of the size of corporations and and just any masses of people conspiracies exist yet the word is being associated with theory and theory is not a bad word theory is a, is a fantastic word people come up with theories it's how we think we have a theory hmm i think maybe it's this and then we check is it that is it not that in science they have theories that have actually been tested against evidence or, or proofs and they say yeah well now it is officially a scientific theory which isn't the same as a standard you know Joe, Joe on the streets theory about why things happen because there's actually evidence against it so these words are being manipulated and associated and they're trying to redefine the words like conspiracy to make you think that oh a conspiracy it's oh it's obviously made up and it's obviously some wing that with the tinfoil hat that's that's talking about it well I mean take a look at all the presidents Kennedy and all the way through and all these people talking about conspiracies that are actually happening we need to be watching out for them so who who would argue that conspiracies aren't that are all fabricated conspiracies aren't real aren't true the only people that would argue that conspiracies don't happen and conspiracies aren't true are by people who are conspiring to do things who else would care <laughs> no it's not within anybody else's interest to say conspiracies don't exist if they're being you know uh if they're being done behind their backs like there's, there's no advantage for anyone to argue that a conspiracy doesn't exist other than the people who are doing conspiracies so that's just an interesting little bit of logic if you think about it and uh the news media also uh, we're gonna stay off that subject for right now okay so archetypes and your definitions archetypes when we have an archetype um it's our starting point so we're willing to redefine it so if you think of a chair or you think of a race car you think that yeah well when you start getting things that are sort of gray you might be willing to redefine your definition of what a chair is to include a tree stump or you might redefine your definition of archetype to uh, or of, of a car to include a go-kart yeah it's a car it's got four wheels depends on how you define it right now collectively we should be trying to define things because we're communicating words you to communicate ideas to other people so it doesn't matter if your definition is you know in your head is the way you define it we need to have everybody in order for you to communicate properly everybody needs to be running on the same definitions in order for ideas to be communicated effectively otherwise it's what's the point if we're all using words that have different meanings the language falls apart right the idea of transferring the idea just doesn't work anymore okay so uh yeah so we need to uh allow our archetypes to be redefined and this is a tool also that uh manipulators will use they know that we a rational person allows their concepts their definitions to be slightly modified to be added to uh to be augmented like chair or race car um and they will start pushing it and redefining it and bending it and twisting it and, and making it grow until it's something that it no longer is. And, uh, and, and you'll see a lot of people who don't allow closed minded people don't allow their definitions, their archetypes to be changed at all. They think that this is whatever they define it as is fact and it will never change. And these are the types of people that will get emotional and angry, uh, and, 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 
when you give them evidence against their definition or their belief of something, they they get angry. When you when you show them evidence against their beliefs, and then they and then they get mad at you, even though there's irrefutable evidence showing them to be wrong, because they're closed minded and they don't want to. They're they're having this cognitive dissonance where their brain is fighting with itself because you're giving them irrefutable evidence and they don't want to face it. They don't want to believe it. So they get angry. They get angry at you for their logical flaws. Now, that's their issue. But, you know, we need to be aware. If you feel yourself starting to get angry when somebody is uh, giving you evidence now that you need to assess, is that valid evidence? Is it not valid evidence? But, I mean, this is something we need to watch out for ourselves. If you feel that you're starting to get angry, you think, well, why am I getting emotional? I shouldn't be getting emotional unless they're attacking you. Well, that's a different story. But if somebody's giving you information and they're calm and they're not, you know, passively, aggressively trying to make you look like a total asshole, you, you could sit back and, and, and say, hmm, I'm getting, why am I starting? I'm starting to feel some kind of a cognitive dissonance because I've, I'm, they're giving me evidence against what I thought was that case. So maybe we should look at this evidence and see, maybe I should be willing to change my mind. But I mean, this is, it's a slippery slope. You got to get, you have to be balanced to be open to new information, but you can't be you can't be closed minded. Like I said in the last video, you can't be uh, a, a skeptic that doesn't believe the truth, and you can't be a naive person that believes lies. So this is where the balancing starts coming in. Uh, camera was full, so we're starting second video. Okay, um, where was I talking about? Um, so a closed minded person who doesn't allow their archetypes to be redefined in the face of new evidence is, is a valuable target for the manipulator because once they've been uh, coerced or manipulated to believe something, they will hold on to that belief staunchly uh, for the rest of their days. Whereas somebody who is um, open-minded, they might be easily or easier to convince of something, but then some way down the, in the future when you're when the manipulator is not around might show them expose them to new proofs new evidence and that person will be easily swayed away from what the manipulator wanted them to believe so it's not really with for worthwhile for uh for a manipulator to manipulate an open-minded person. So they generally look for closed-minded people. Closed-minded people, the type of people that a manipulator wants to because they hold on to their, their brainwashing better. It sticks longer because they don't want to accept new information that contradicts what they believe, even though it's what they believe is garbage. This, uh, this reminds me of, uh, of, a, of, of an incident that happened to me. Uh, quick backstory. I was... Um, I was training in the Canadian military and, uh, and the Americans had come up and we were doing like co-training with them and they, uh, had brought their helicopters and, uh, we were flying around in these Hueys. I was just infantry, but, uh, we were flying around in, in the Hueys and we were doing these landings. I was a young guy. So we would come in, we'd skid with the Hueys along the ground. I don't know if this, the guys were just yanking our chains, but this is what we were doing. The helicopter, the Hueys would come in and we'd slide the helicopter wouldn't stop and drop it would sort of come in fast and sort of slide across the ground as soon as it came to a stop we'd run out and we'd all lay on the ground with our you know our rifles over our heads on the ground face down uh in a, in a like a chevron so the pilot from from the left side of the helicopter going out on an angle and from the right side of the helicopter going out from not front of the chair or his the pilot's door but from you know the, the door the back of the door we wouldn't go past the skis the skids anyway so we go back so the pilot could look to his left and he could see us all light out and he looked to the right and he'd see us all laying out and then he would take off and the and the rotors would drop in the front and he would take off and this was some kind of a rapid deployment thing and anyways we did that like whatever a couple times and then we'd go on and do our whatever we were doing out in the woods and uh the helicopters would come back pick us up again and and i remember flying through the uh we were doing this load of the whatever they call it and it wasn't load of the deck i don't know what they came out anyways it was we were there, sit with us and then in these hueys with the doors open sitting in the side and we were flying along uh these riverbanks between the like the, the trees would come down to the river and we'd be below the tree level and we'd be flying along through the the creeks the rivers and uh it was exciting, you know, sitting there looking out and I was trying to look down behind the chopper looking for rotor wash and, uh, you know, and the water zipping by. It was very exhilarating. You can imagine, right? So I, it was, it was, it was an exhilarating thing for me to remember. And, uh, another thing we had, they had these, I think they were called the Chinooks. 
uh, the the choppers with the big twin rotors. Anyways, uh, they were they would carry us out as well, and we'd all put our earplugs in, and we were carrying. It was I can't remember what the deal was, but we we had our uh, rucksacks and stuff, so it was a it wasn't like an overnight thing. But anyways, we were carrying a lot more gear, so uh, they would land, and we'd all climb out and go out and do what we're doing, and we had earplugs in, and then when the things came back, the the choppers came back to bring us back. I was so tired and my buddy Richie was we were like so beat. We're just sitting in the on the in the field waiting for the waiting from the land. We're like, God, I'm so tired. We're you know, you could imagine doing whatever we're doing, marching and whatever the fuck. Anyway, so I didn't feel like rummaging through my bag to dig out my earplugs. And neither did Richie. So we're like, Yeah, fuck it, how loud could it be? I mean, we were in it, it didn't seem that loud with the earplugs in. So they land, we you know, they're screaming at us to get in this. So we all get up and we go running in, get climbing the stupid chopper and the and the tailgates down the back, we climb inside and uh, we, had, we had to go in an angle because the rotor rush the, or the jet engines were blowing anyways so we got in and they uh, the, the, <laughs> we take off and Richie looked over at me and he was like it was so loud the, the, the jet engines it's amazing how much the earplugs attenuate the, the scream but it wasn't the thump it was just the jet engine screaming like just crazy loud and he looked at me and he was like plugging his ears and we were just laughing because it was it was so we felt like idiots because we were too tired and too lazy just to pull out our earplugs so we had to sit there and suffer and it was it was too tight to rummage i guess i could have probably still pulled them out at that point but we just we just didn't care we we're just kind of laughing about how stupid it was anyways so those those are things that i remember there's a lot of other stuff but those are the those are the sort of exciting sort of stupid moments flying around in the helicopters anyway so um years later decades later i'm talking with this guy um whose whose son was uh was in the military or is in the military i I think he's still in anyways and uh so he's just you know saying how his son's in and i'm like oh yeah well i was you know in the infantry and we were flying around in these i told him this you know the memorable stories that you know that i remember that you know stuck and flying around in the hueys with the doors open and uh you know forgetting my earplugs in the in the uh, chinook or whatever that fuck that thing was and uh and he looks at me after i tell him the, my stories and he's like they don't do that and i was like what I'm like yeah i did like but he wasn't joking he just looked at me and was like they don't do that and I'm like, holy fuck, what the hell? I was like, I was seriously knocked back on my heels. I was like, what the hell's the deal with this guy? And, you know, it, it it knocked me off balance. And I was just like, so many things are going through my mind at this point. It's like, what's this guy's deal? What an asshole. And I think like, like, what's going on here? Like, how could he think that I'm lying? First off, like, he, yeah, people call you and say bullshit. That's fine. People say bullshit all the time. But it really floored me that this guy honestly thought that like he w- he wasn't in the military his kid was in the military so i was trying to make sense of what his so i'm like yeah and he wouldn't he wasn't having any of it he was like no no they don't do that <laughs> so so i was trying to figure out what's going on in this guy's head for him to honestly think that you know i'm full of shit you know so i i had the only thing i could think of is this guy he he has this archetype of or stereotype or archetype yeah of what the of what happens in the military and he in his mind uh that stuff just doesn't happen it, he didn't imagine it happening so in his mind it doesn't happen maybe his son told him what he had you know done whatever and so whatever his son did does, does did uh his little sample is the monolith of what happens to everybody everywhere all the time like i was ooh. We had a technical difficulty there. Something fell over. Um, so where was I? Yeah. So this guy in his mind, he imagined what he imagined happened was more, uh, had more weight to him than my first hand experience of what actually happened. So in his mind, his imagination dictates or has more weight for him than what reality what what real what really happened to somebody else like there's got to be a psychological term for this right and and there is it's called being an asshole so he made it an assumption and he believed his assumptions are fact and this is common and so we need to be we we need to use him as an example of what you know we shouldn't be doing like uh so whenever you make an assumption or if you hear something you know and somebody's telling you a firsthand experience of what happened and you were never there. You never experienced anything, whether you believe them or not. You could think, well, 
that has more weight than what I imagined to happen. <laughs> His perception of reality is distorted to the point where he's obviously like, imagine I'm not the only person that experienced this talking to the guy and you talk to him for, you know, any length of time and you realize this guy is just whatever he thinks is right in his mind is right. He's such a closed minded dick that he's the perfect target for, you know, manipulation because once you brainwash this guy, he's going to hold on to it for the rest of his life. But I mean, this is, this is a recurring thing that you see if you've read Sherlock Holmes, it was, it was uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. It must've been something that burned his ass when he saw a lot of these arrogant, pompous asshole, British people, um, police, especially, um, making assumptions and then make and then believing their assumptions are right because the way he he talked about scotland yard he <laughs> he had contempt for those guys in all the cases and the whole point was sherlock holmes would be like you know inspector lestrade would you know whatever come up with some half-ass uh look at the evidence it kind of looks like this so this is what happened and holmes would that's the whole point of Sherlock Holmes to, to counter what these assumptions are and to say, no, it's, you know, whatever, you know, whatever. Ha- and I can't remember what his quote is, but you get the idea. And if you watch, if you read Conan and Doyle or watching even the, the TV shows and movies or whatever, they pretty much talk about that. And that's, 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 that's the whole concept here of how close minded people are uh, jump to conclusions and then hold on to those conclusions as fact. They will not. And and this is something we need to watch out for in ourselves. Don't jump to conclusions. And if you do uh, have uh, a conclusion about something, it's not. You know, it may not be fact. It may not be true. You know, it's just it's just a a, a temporary. Uh, assessment of what's with what's going on. You need to be more like Sherlock Holmes and less like Inspector Lestrade. You know, uh, follow the evidence, see where things lead you. Doesn't matter what you you want to believe, or doesn't matter what you first believed. You know, first impressions are notoriously wrong. And uh, so this guy is a is a good example of that. But it is it was he is so close minded and so. So, I don't know, it just knocked me back on my feet, my heels, to 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 see somebody that, like, wow, this guy is really close-minded and arrogant. Like, phew. But this is how, you know, using these heuristics, these guesses, this is how traps work. Animals use these, these right? So, you see, uh, we see a booby trap. We see food. We may not notice all the stuff around it, right? We're going to make guesses. You know, a duck sees a, a wood block of wood that looks like a duck you know oh that looks like a duck i can think it's a duck and i'm gonna go fly down and sit next to that duck and then they're gonna get shot by the hunter with a shotgun because he he used this thing because he knows ducks are gonna be using these heuristics and they're gonna get fooled because they're just gonna assume the duck's gonna see something that looks like a duck and it's gonna assume it's a duck and then it's gonna believe it's a duck and then it's gonna get shot so we don't want to be like that duck and we don't want to be like that dude so these are these are good lessons for us to try to figure out um you know how to protect ourselves don't be so close-minded we know uh yeah don't be so confident in your in your assumptions and just because somebody tells you something doesn't mean that that's true so i mean it's true that just because i was telling him something in his mind doesn't mean it's true but that certainly doesn't mean that it was like i don't even know what kind of logic this guy was using because i'm sure his does it matter if his son had a different experience that doesn't mean that my experience didn't happen either i mean obviously you know two people going on a trip to texas are going to have different experiences if they're going at different times you know what i mean one guy goes there doesn't get a flat tire doesn't mean the next guy that goes there is not going to get a flat tire because the first guy didn't this isn't this is insane this is like such faulty rational irrational uh thinking but it's amazing that people do it and they hold on to it with death grips yeah so our granted this this guy who i'm talking about here he was i guess in his 50s and uh people who get older your brains are just as maybe not just as but your brains are still plastic you could still you know learn new things you can learn a new instrument at any age you can learn a new language it's harder but you still can and some of these people just get tired of maybe when they get older and they just don't care or i mean i've seen young people with very closed-minded and it's just it's a lazy way of thinking um but i 
At any age, our brains are plastic and we can let go of wrong information at any age. And uh, manipulators know this. People, the hardcore brainwashers know this and they can brainwash anybody, soldiers and stuff and, well, anybody. And uh, there's manuals on this. I, you know, on, on how to actually break somebody. And we'll talk about this in, in the next episode and uh, where they actually completely break somebody. Their character is removed and they have a new set of beliefs instilled. Now, I don't know how many times this can happen to a person. Um, you know, when we start and we talk about Pavlov and his dogs and how some of the dogs, it's pretty spooky, the stuff, you know, you hear about the bell with the dogs, but Pavlov actually had... Well, we'll talk about it in the in the next episode. But the, where the 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 programming, the training of the dogs can be totally erased by breaking them mentally, and then this is can be done to humans. Um, not to say all humans or all dogs, you know, they, they react differently to different situations. But yeah, so there's there's a way to actually break people and reprogram their brains. So, I mean, we, we can learn new things at all ages. We can be broken uh, and reprogrammed. But I don't know. It's be interesting to know how many times you can do that to a person. I guess it's pretty immoral to the Chinese probably know. I mean, the Chinese Communist Party, they've, they've probably broken people and then broke them again and then broke them again just to see how many times you could, you know, before their their brain, be, you know, turns to mush. But I can't imagine it being able to do that too many times. Anyways, it, uh, we'll be talking about that extreme kind of stuff in the next video. If you're, if you feel that you're getting polarized, extreme to one side, you know there's something off. No, no, it could be a logical fallacy to say you know one extreme is wrong and the other extreme is right, or that the truth is somewhere between. That is also a fallacy because sometimes. You know, the truth is at one extreme. Sometimes the truth is in the middle. Sometimes the truth is at the other end. But um, typically, if you feel, especially if somebody's trying to convince you to be, uh, you know, all this, all that, you know, you know, that's something to watch out for. Yeah. So, yeah, next episode, we'll be talking a bit about the, uh, the, the hardcore breaking of people that have, that has happened. You know, the CIA discovered the Chinese being the first ones that did, that did this, you know, uh, stunning the work of the Russians, you know, from Pavlov and then a lot of these other people, a few, a couple other people. And, uh, yeah, so stay tuned. We'll talk about uh, brainwashing. Uh, and I don't know if that's neuroplasticity, <laughs> but we'll talk about that next time. All right.